So yeah, uh, thanks for uh, hosting this uh, workshop. And uh, I will tell you a little bit about what we did with our Swedish AV RAN from uh, the NB Palmer this season. Uh, the data is still being, we are still working with the data, so I won't be able to show so much results, but I can tell you what we did and what we learned um, from an engineering point of view, at least. And my name is Anna Wolin. I'm a professor of physical oceanography at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And on board uh, from Sweden was also Li Ling, who is a PhD student in Stockholm, and Anders Sjöval and Mark Simons, who are AUV technicians. And if you want to learn more about our AUV, you can click on follow this link there and you will see more details about sensors and everything. Um, so the, um, our AV is quite large and I think most of you who are joining here know very well what that means, but just to summarize and get us started, um, the large AVs, they are faster in general than compared to, for example, gliders, which means that they can survey larger areas in shorter time. And because they are large, they are stable platforms and the Kongsberg Hugin AUV, which is the brand we have, is actually designed for good acoustic serving. And the acoustic um, instruments that we have on board are upward and downward looking multi beams and ADCPs, etc. The drawback with these big AVs is that it's a very big operation to bring them. You need, uh, they take up space on board. They come in 30 or 40 foot containers. They are also expensive to maintain and operate. And they block space uh, people on board also. You need, for our AV, you need at least four persons to be able to operate it well. So in my opinion, the best usage is if you use them for unique research tasks to get the data that you only can get with the big AVs. For example, under Antarctica's ice shelves or also down in uh, very deep, if you want to me measure deep uh, areas near the sea floor. Um, and here is a picture of our AUV. Uh, it lives in a 40 foot container and inside that container we have the AUV itself and a launch and recovery system. And this was new for last season. We, we had not tested it before, so we were a bit nervous, but I think it worked quite nicely, actually. But yeah, it's a big operation, even just to lift it on board. You need a special crane and a special oak here so that it won't break in the lift. Uh, and there are some um, jigsaw puzzling to do to make room for, for it on board and make sure that the other projects also get their space. And here's a picture from the off deck of Palmer and how we try to work around looking at the different options and so on. So this work needs to be done before you bring it. Um, and uh, on Palmer, we also have to manufacture special plates that could be used to fasten it on deck because you can't weld into the deck of Palmer. So we needed to wait for this to be manufactured locally in Chile. So it, it's, it's a big operation. But next time it goes on Palmer, it will be much easier, I think, because now we have these plates already. Um, and our AV is depth rated to 3000 meters and it has battery on board for missions up to 300 kilometers. It's uh, moving at cruise speed, two to six knots. And the good thing, this one is that it has very good navigation. So this movie is from some tests that we did in Sweden, in winter in Sweden, and it came back like this after traveling 10 hours under the ice. And we launched and recovered from the dock. We didn't have a ship. And we were very, very happy with, this, with the results of this navigation. And it does, as long as it has um, contact with either seabed or ice, it really has good navigation. And we have uh, all in all, at the moment, 31 sensors, including upward and downward looking multi-beam, temperature, salinity, oxygen, nitrate, CO2, and also capacity to sample water. 
Um, and this is an example of the unique data that you can get from an AUV. So the image here shows um, the bathymetry from the ship multibeam, which is a very good the ship uh, Palmer multibeam. It's a good multibeam. But Palmer is on the surface, so in this area it's 600 meter deep, so you get quite a coarse image regardless. And one unique thing you can do is to send the AUV close to the seabed, so you get much higher resolution. Then you get this image. So using the AUV we can get some information. These high resolution images tell us what processes were active when the ice was here last time. These uh, tracks here, they were formed as ice moved over this area at very high pressure. And you can only get this with AUVs. You need to get be very close to the seabed to get this type of resolution. Um, and uh, in addition to the multibeam, we have something called a side scan sonar that you get even higher resolution. But the side scan sonar does not tell you numbers on depth, but they, they, you work with them like a camera, an acoustic camera. And also with the side scan, you see these uh, marks here made on the seabed, ice moving under high pressure. And we think it, it's also the tides played a role in making these. Uh, marks here. They are sharper and deeper. Every 14 marks get sharper and deeper. So we think we see traces of neap and spring tide when the ice was moving. Um, yeah, so uh, I think Karen will tell you a bit more about the overview of the expedition and why we went there, but we wanted to study Thwaites Glacier, which um, empties out into the Amundsen Sea. And the reason for that is that it's important for predictions of future sea level rise. And we had uh, two big AUVs on board, and Karen will tell you more about water sub long range. And we divided the tasks so that our RAN here on the left was used to go quite close to the ice edge, to make maps and uh, find resolution service. And uh, boat to Mac boat face was sent in much further in under the ice and uh, did typically one track in and one track out. So we didn't get so much fine scale information, but we got information from uh, further in. So that worked quite nicely. I think they, they complemented each other very well in that respect. Here is a picture of uh, what it looks like when we launch. So inside the container here, there's a, an arm that two arms that uh, get extended by hydraulics and when they are far out it tips down into the water and the uh, gravity helps the EV to get into the water. And then when you have done the mission then it comes back, you have a grapple hook and you hook it with a rope that comes off the nose of the EV and then you winch it in into the directly into the container. Uh, yeah, we were worried about this because we hadn't used it before, but we were very, very happy with this launch and recovery system. It, it became quite a lot safer than the other types of operations that we have done when you had to lift it with a crane and have a small boat in the water and so on. Um, and here is a picture just before it's launched into the ocean. We managed to operate in quite rough seas as well. And if we had been uh, depending on the small boats in the water, we would not have been able to either launch or recover in that weather. So, as I said, we are still processing data, but we do have data from these um, tracks here. Because of the ice, sea ice conditions, we were forced to go to the neighboring glacier, Dotson Ice Shelf, instead of Thwaites Glacier, Thwaites Ice Shelf. And um, we were quite happy with that from our side because it meant that we could test the AUV and do some nice stuff in a system that's easier to comprehend compared to Twaits. Dots on ice shelf has only one opening and it's pointing north and we have fairly good uh, prior knowledge of the thickness and speed and everything. But um, Twaits Glacier has several openings and it's a much more, much more complicated, we know much less about it, and it's a bigger system overall. 
so the the tracks here show you what the missions look like. The the ones that are colored is where we had good navigation from start to end, and we also did uh, it, that were near the ice. The black more the black tracks out here they were never near the ice, and these tracks here they went near the ice, but we had not good navigation because uh, there were several um, bugs and settings that we needed to figure out before um, we got it working properly. But and we, we have some hope that we might be able to recover good navigation from these black tracks when we look at um, feature recognition and so on, but there's quite a lot of work remaining. So we have focused, in the post-processing, we are focusing at the moment on these colored lines here. So from these um, missions, we have hydrography, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, optical backscatter, currents to some extent. We are still working with the ocean currents from the ABCPs. Some are good, but some are clearly something wrong with. So we have to work together with RDI and Cogsberg uh, to get them good enough to publish, I think. We also got some water samples and we have uh, multi-beam data from the seabed and from the ice and more. All in all, we did 14 AUV missions and the total distance travel was over 1,700 kilometers and over 1,000 kilometers were under ice. So that was a good, uh, we are happy <laughs> with this, even if we didn't get to Twaits. Um, we thought this side of the project worked quite nicely. The, the things we have learned already uh, is uh, we got some technical results. We got the upward looking DVL to work properly. There was some figuring out. There were settings that uh, were wrong. We didn't realize that until we tested. And there were some bugs that we found and other things. So we had all in all four missions with quite bad navigation when it was supposed to navigate under the ice. And now it works and we think it's, it's very robust. It's, um, we learned also that the bathymetry below the ice is quite rugged and horrible and the ice is not so horrible. So actually at the end we prefer to go near the ice compared to near the seabed. So we, we, we trust it. Maybe stupidly, but we do trust it quite well now. And we also tested uh, the avoidance maneuvering. Uh, it's supposed to, we know that it avoids obstacles at the seabed, but we weren't sure whether it would avoid as nicely when it comes to ice, but it does do that. So that's nice to know. We just tested it. And we learned, um, so the way, the way it operates with the avoidance maneuver is that you have a planned path that is you set the depth, the preferred depth for the AUV, the plan A depth, and then you set a setting called safe distance, and that is typically maybe 50 meters or something. And that distance is kept to either the seabed or to ice. Then you have to also consider that the upward looking DVL that is used for navigation has a certain reach. In our case, it's um, 180 meters, that's the technical specification, and that is under perfect conditions. So it turned out that our DVL, we can't trust any more than 100 meters. So in uh, practice, it's 100 meter, the DVL reach. And the difference here, so this is the playroom that you have, the difference between the DVL reach and the safe distance. So there it can safely adjust. And then, um, when it comes into an area where the ice is thicker than you thought it would be, you have a planned path here and suddenly the UV sees the ice coming down and intruding into the safe distance and then it adjusts by going to a lower, deeper down to keep the safe distance. And then we learned that um, if you don't know the bathymetry or the ice draft well enough and you have cracks in the ice and we learned that there are many, many, there are cracks, cracks all over the place here. We found 100 cracks or so in the dots on ice shelf. And uh, when you're in a situation where the AV has adjusted 
so that in order to keep the safe distance, it's lower than originally planned. And when it enters into an area where you have a crack, then it suddenly feels that, okay, now it's clear ahead. I can move up again to the original depth. And then because uh, these cracks can be super sharp, uh, some of them have like 90 degree angle. If it's up, then at an, uh, if it adjusts up, it means it will sort of get trapped inside this crack. And um, because they are, this AV is big and uh, it's slow to turn, it has a turning radius of uh, 60 meters, maybe 90 meters, uh, depending on the circumstances. That means that it can easily be trapped in here without any way to escape. So in order to avoid this, you need to either have a good idea before you plan the mission of the general thickness of the ice, or you need to know exactly where the cracks are. Um, so that's uh, the main, I, I believe this, something similar to this has happened to AutoSub uh, previously. And um, yeah, if we, if you have a bad uh, guess for the initial guess for the ice shelf thickness, then uh, it's very easy to lose it. In our case, we would never learn, it would just not show up, it would be lost inside a crack. Um, so if we turn to the data that we have, we have um, the new, this wasn't tested before, the new upward looking multibeam. In 2019, we had a multibeam that was called E1000 um, or something like that, a much older model, and we didn't get any data that could be used for anything out of it. So we bought this new upgrade and it worked very nicely. We got some high resolution maps of the underside of the ice. And here's an example on the right. Oops, sorry. Uh, so you see these uh, things cutting across are the cracks that I talked about. Um, this crack is about 100 meter across. And this one you see here is uh, maybe 30 and then it's tapers out into zero, and up here is an older crack. Uh, the, the widest ones were about 400 meters across. And you can, uh, if you look at the raw data of the multibeam, you can just see the pings disappear. They just go, there's no, no return at all. There's no, nothing coming back. <laughs> they just go into these cracks and get lost. Um, but to get this map, it was many, processing steps and trials, even after we got correct navigation working, you can, there are many traps here that you can fall into in the post-processing because uh, multibeams are designed to look downward and it's not simply multiplying by minus one when you turn them upside down, you have to adjust for the pressure and the, some other steps. So we on board, we, we got very excited several times <laughs> and posted pictures on the door and everything. and. Uh, then we learned, oh, this is actually wrong. But now we have it right, we think. Uh, and then we also had a long range ADCP. It has a thousand meter range. And uh, we used that to, before we went near the ice, we went in under the ice near the seabed to get some idea from this long range ADCP of the ice draft, because um, you can see where it uh, had a large, return. So we got, it's only one, one beam, but we got some estimates for ice draft and that was very good considering what we realized afterwards that there was a real danger of the vehicle getting stuck inside the cracks. Uh, and this uh, also we hope we, we have, we can see that we have data, ADCP data of good quality for veloc water velocity but we can't, we have not managed to process it well yet. We are working together with RDI and Kogsberg. You need to do a post-processing similar to what you do from a ship-worn ADCP. And um, yeah, it hasn't been done yet for this type of ADCP. Uh, and other data that we have is, uh, this is a map of uh, chlorophyll concentration. Uh, and uh, this is, um, about six kilometers in from the ice shelf front. So we, uh, it's surprising that we see high 
chlorophyll water here and we are pretty sure this must come from the outside so this means that some water makes it in makes a detour in underneath the ice shelf and at the same time we know that it's problematic for water currents to enter under the ice because you have this very abrupt step so to conserve uh, potential vorticity it's uh, hard because of potential vorticity conservation it's hard for ocean currents to get in under this sharp step but this is uh, clearly shown that you have some of that entering anyway probably it has to compensate by relative vorticity in order to make it in this far and the same from uh, whoops I thought I had a uh, so yeah, yeah, sorry. We this high productivity water we noticed also on the outside that there is high productivity in the water at the ice shelf front, both on the ice itself. If you look closely here, you see these brownish things growing on the ice, but also in the melt water outside. There were, the the water was very brown here as soon as you got close to the ice shelf. And the high productivity water is also associated with high dissolved oxygen. So these are this is an SB43 oxygen sensor, and this is from an optical uh, echo pack sensor, and you can see the overlap here. Um, yeah, I, I think that's all from me. So we have learned some valuable lessons, I think, for. Uh, most importantly is to find as much as you can about the ice shelf thickness and cracks before you enter. Um, and uh, if possible, go in near the seabed with an instrument that can get the draft from a high distance. And um, we, we, th this was our plan A before we went for Swades Glacier and now because of the sea as we ended up quite a bit west of here and it would be nice to use the things that we have learned now and take our AV back and try to get in here again and do plan A in another season and we have had some talks with the Copri scientists in Lyoness, uh, Won Sang Lee, I think he saw him here uh, to do uh, further AV missions from our own and we are also investigating that there might be a potential for new US or British expedition in coming years to complete these things we didn't do. I think that was all. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much Anna for a wonderful talk and you know very exciting results. Uh, um, I guess there might be or there should be some questions I hope. Uh, I'm not sure the best way to do this. Does, it, does people want to put their hands up if they want to ask a question? Nothing so far. Oh, <laughs> I have many questions. <laughs> uh, very exciting. I was, uh, the maps you were showing of the fluorescence and the, the oxygen, was the AUV at a, at a set depth for that entire mission or did, was it changing depth with the ice above? No, it, it was um, when we were running close to the ice, it was always at a set depth. Sometimes it had to adjust down in order to avoid the ice but then in that mission it was on a constant depth i don't i think it was at 300 meters or something i, I can't remember 250 or maybe 300. Yeah. i think karen had a question also yeah great karen uh, and i had a question about your long range uh, adcp um that's Upward looking, or did you have one going up and down? No, that's upward looking. The long range was only looking up. It was a huge instrument. And then we yeah. also have two, one upward and one downward that are higher frequency. So they only have a 180 meter maximum range. Mm. So what, what frequency was it, the, the long range one? Uh, 40, 
five, I believe, forty-five okay, kilohertz, so if I remember so correctly. Similar to the yeah. thirty-eight Big. kilohertz one on the ship, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank it was you. so heavy. Got a question from Damien. Yeah, thanks. That was really exciting. It was taking me forever there to find how to figure out how to put my hand up. I haven't used Zoom in a while. I've had that luxury. Um, that was awesome. <clears throat> Anna, are you planning to use the two awkward looking ADCPs? Do you have is do you have the data that will support analysis of the two awkward looking ADCPs to see if they you can confirm that they're both flowing in the same direction, that kind of thing? Are the bin yeah. sizes and, and orientations going to work for that? We, we we have we have the data from the two AV, the two ADCPs were operating simultaneously and also we have the downward looking which was also so that should also and we also have the ship ADCP to compare with so we should be able to do it it's just that there's so many things to do and I'm actually hiring a student this fall and I'm gonna give her or him the task the first task is to try to work out just look at the data that we have and try to combine it. I think that's a very good quality control. I, I'm I'm very suspicious of the ADCP data from uh, our AV, as you may be here. I want to see it, but when the 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 long range ADCP operated, it was completely standalone, and uh, mm -hmm. that will be post processed completely independently. So if they overlap, if, they, if we get the same, then I trust it. But uh, otherwise, uh, yeah. We... And does the Kongsberg uh, system, does it, does it calculate, does it do all of the transformations for you? Or are you dealing with uh, just instrument frame that you have to do all of the, the, the frames of reference calculations? They, they do it. They, they have a software that does the conversion. It, it's, but the thing is that that software is made after a downward looking DVL navigation mm. and uh, we are the first to use the upward looking DVL for navigation so none of their systems work very well for I mean we get we know that we get live we have good navigation live we, it comes out where it's supposed to come out we have small error in the navigation but when we do one thing that doesn't work is the post processing, the built in their house post processing of navigation. Normally, you just run that and you get the navigation that's slightly improved. But um, <laughs> we have some fun times on board when we run that uh, click and go post processing. And we, we actually had it orbiting out into space and uh, then returning back to Earth, things like that. It were clearly wrong. And I think also the, and we know that the post-processing of the ADCP uh, to get velo water velocity, that software is also not clearly not designed for the upward looking DVL. I think they need to sit down a little bit in the coming year and work with all their post-processing software and adapt it to the upward looking DVL. I reckon you're better off doing it yourself from first principles, Maybe. just taking the raw ADCP files yeah. and just just taking it from the instrument frame and just doing all of your very just its accountancy at that stage yeah and and also yeah. maybe filtering out your filtering out the, the data collected while the vehicle is very um, unstable or any time you're pitching so those areas around the cracks for example your vehicle's going to be doing this uh, in our yeah. experience that makes the ADCP data just go kind of junky because you you don't uh, know what okay. what 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 motion are you removing from the ADCP? Are you removing as the ping departs the vehicle, as it returns back to the vehicle, midway in yeah. between or some kind of integrated? Um, but if yeah. you've got a vehicle that's very stable, uh, that's less of a problem. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, and maybe that's also a very good exercise for this uh, student. But we, I want to keep Kongsberg involved because A, they will be interested in in this uh, development and B, it's good if other customers also get access to it yeah. and it doesn't cost us anything to keep them and they, they are they know what they are doing so i i also found in ours um, a boundary effect of some sort and I, I had very little data to test it but i had to effectively filter out the first 12 
15 meters and it seems to be related i think to the length of the vehicle um of, uh -huh. of data just just something to look at to see are you seeing excessive speeds in the direction of the vehicle um yeah and, uh, in, in those nearer bins at your high in your higher okay. frequency adcp yeah do you think that's um, um is that like a, because of the bound a real boundary layer or do you think that doesn't that's have a logarithmic effect? profile um but I was talking to one of the naval architects uh, here, and uh, he suggested uh, it was a it was a pressure effect. Uh, I, I, it's out of my uh, scope, but I'd love to talk about it another time. Maybe I could show you yeah. our figures from source tool. Thank you. Yeah, that would be fantastic. When the student has started, I, I yeah, yeah, that yeah, that'd be great. Me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so filter filter out the motion is is the thing I'd say as much as possible. Yeah. Thank you. Very good advice. Yeah. Oh, I'm we'll really excited touch. to see how it turns out. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Some other questions? Oh, while we're waiting for some more to turn up, I, I might just ask you, Anna. I mean, what an amazing campaign. And f so 14 mi missions, was that 14 days worth of operation? Or were you able to do multiple missions on certain days? Uh, no, I think we stuck about 24 hour missions that's what we tried and i think we did 24 hours mostly but we were doing missions while the ship was doing other things so typically we would um, launch and then go away and do a transect or a uu ctd or or launch or alr or something and then uh, when it was time to get back up we we started moving the ship oh. this was possible because we were in quite a limited space we were doing lots and lots of things in front of dots on ice shelf so it's not that big okay and a follow-up question were you were you sort of maintaining acoustic communications throughout or did you just uh, did, was no, that because of the we, rain well, or because it got, you pulled it up out of the water we, we had no we um i know you had shipping problems we also had shipping problems um our acoustic communication was lost by DHL, it's still not returned. We just got the message that it's going to be sold on executive auction because we haven't collected it. <laughs> Don't get me started, but it meant we had no way of communicating. So we had to, we had said originally that uh, that was a game stopper for us, a show stopper, but then we determined the show has changed slightly. So let's go anyway. <laughs> So there was no point at all in us hanging around. We just launched and then went. So that's amazing. <laughs> Hang on. That's really <laughs> quite amazing. Did that mean, because <laughs> normally, well, we'd, you'd imagine it's in the water and then you send the message to launch the mission. How were they, how are they launching? Just f as soon as time. it hit the water or time, a time yeah, we, delay? We started the mission on the surface. So we, we launched and then, um, it waited for, for our um, signal and then we, we launched and when the ship said okay it's safe you can start we, we sent a signal via radio and then it started amazing <laughs> 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 the show has changed <laughs> yeah uh and the final question and if, um i guess yeah i mean it's all about uh building up the capability over various seasons and you've made a huge step forward from where you were a couple of years back where where do you think you'll be going next with your type of uh, missions more of the same I, I, I honestly sorry to be boring but i think more of the same mm -hmm. this was like a proof of concept for us in yeah. a bit we um, this is where we wanted to go and it, it took four years more to get here it, we have this is our plan a was to get here where we are now except for the adcp but we believe the adcp is working it's a question of right pro post processing yes um no I, I i would like to use what we have now i don't want to make any big changes actually we can of course add another sense or, or so but i'm quite happy with this mode of operation and then you need to Maybe we should sit down and think also, it works well with, you saw the maps. It, it's, we're not used to thinking about maps of the ocean like that. We are used to thinking of vertical, you know, stations so that you build a vertical transect. And this is slightly different. And 
yeah, yeah um, we should think about what is it worth really when you when push come to shove with these maps should we try to be it's, it's a bit more risky but I think, and above all when you go up and down like a zigzag like the gliders do you lose navigation mm -hmm. because you leave the seabed before you hit the ice mm -hmm. so every time you do that you ha have a dip in the the navigation so is it worth it but that can certainly be you know mission planning there's much to do there but i don't want to change any big things actually with the other things that's um that's that well that's a that's a great indication of a successful campaign if you're you know, completely satisfied and and just yeah order the same again yeah great <laughs> Uh, I must admit, I probably have another thousand questions, but I'm not going to do them today. I'll look forward to another chance to catch up with you in more detail. And if there's no other questions, I might take the time to um, get over to say thanks again to Anna.